Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Pumped Two-Phase Cooling, the Advanced Thermal Management Solution for Emerging High-Power Electronics Applications, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. Also, twice during the presentation today, we will present you with a poll question, which we invite you to answer at the appropriate time. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Kimberly Fixie is a sales engineer for both the Defense Aerospace and Custom Products groups. Previously, Kim worked for BMT Syntec Technologies as an engineering consultant for NAVC and NRL, working on energy and power projects. After joining ACT, Ms. Fixie has worked with customers to diagnose complex thermal challenges and develop the appropriate thermal management solution. Also on the line for our live Q&A today is Devin Pellicone, Lead Engineer, Special Products at Advanced Cooling Technologies. Devin has over seven years of experience developing advanced thermal solutions for a wide range of aerospace, military, and commercial applications. He has successfully demonstrated prototype thermal management systems for directed energy weapons, power flow controllers, laser diodes, and a variety of high heat flux electronic technologies. So now I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Kimberly Fixie. Kim? Thank you, Billy. As technology advances, the requirements for higher power and tighter spacing increases. These higher power requirements encourage more innovative engineering with unique and futuristic capabilities. However, they present a significant cooling dilemma. Typical cooling techniques are falling short of providing adequate temperature regulation to critical components. Because of this, there's an ever-demanding need for more advanced active cooling technology. We hope that during today's webinar, you will gain an understanding of pumped single-phase cooling while exploring the advances of pumped two-phase cooling. Our webinar will discover the benefits and applications for pumped two-phase cooling while looking at all the thermal obstacles it addresses. The single-phase cooling technique gained popularity as an effective way to cool complex electronic systems. One can achieve high heat transfer coefficients, which will offer greater thermal stability and control than forced air or natural convection. The system is comprised of a cold plate, pump, reservoir, evaporator, and heat exchanger, and handles heat fluxes between 10 to 20 watts per centimeter squared. Typical working fluids include water, ethylene glycol, and an array of refrigerants. As the fluid is pumped through the cold plate, Heat is exchanged from the critical component to the liquid. Higher heat flux components require a faster flow rate to absorb the increase of thermal energy. High performance liquid cold plates with embedded tube, mini channels, or micro channels have been designed and manufactured. These designs are optimized to reduce pressure drop and increase flow uniformity, as well as maximize the heat dissipation. However, even with the expert designs, single-phase cooling fails to keep up with the harsh thermal environment of a more innovative challenge. Let's go to Billy with our first polling question. All right, now it's time for our first poll question today. It will appear on your screen now. The question is, have you experienced projects where single-phase liquid cooling did not meet your thermal requirements? And your choices here are A, yes, recently, B, yes, currently, C, yes, more than a year ago, or D, no. So you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. Again, have you experienced projects where single phase liquid cooling did not meet your thermal requirements? So as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Kim Fixie. Kim? Thank you, Billy. Pumped two phase cooling tech is a technology used to remove heat from high power heat sources in which both liquid and vapor are present. Much like boiling a pot of water, bubbles will form and pull the thermal energy away from the source as they move through the system, thus providing effective heat transfer capabilities. 
Pumps 2 phase utilizes the latent heat of vaporization to remove the thermal energy from the critical components. The following video will show the working fluid bubble, or vapor forming, as we input heat into the system. As the flow progresses to the end of the plate, the working fluid reaches 50% vapor saturation. Let's go to the video. In this video, a thermal load is applied across the plate. As the fluid travels, it begins to boil. The boiling process removes the thermal energy from the component and carries it to the end of the plate. At the exit point, the working fluid is 50% liquid and 50% vapor. Similar to single phase cooling, pumped two phase requires a heat exchanger, reservoir, pump, and cold plate evaporator. However, the technology has a very distinct difference. The working fluid is designed to enter the system near saturation level. When the nearly saturated fluid hits the evaporator, it will begin to boil and remove the heat via the latent heat of vaporization. Let's take a look at the video to see how pumped two phase cooling works versus single phase cooling. Pumped two-phase or evaporative cooling systems use the same basic system level components as the pumped single phase system. However, pumped two-phase systems typically use refrigerants as the working fluid. Through refrigerant selection and appropriate controls, the refrigerant is designed to boil as it acquires heat from the hot surface of the device. More heat can be removed through the boiling process, otherwise known as latent heat, than through sensible heat with single phase cooling. Boiling across the entire evaporator surface offers a further advantage in that the evaporator will have a very uniform surface temperature, typically within a few degrees. As described in the video, pump two phase utilizes the latent heat, where single phase cooling operates with sensible heat or specific heat. Specific heat is the amount of thermal energy per unit mass needed to raise the temperature of a substance 1 degree C and can be calculated as Q equals Cm delta T, where Q is the heat added, C is the specific heat, M is mass, and delta T is the change in temperature. Latent heat is the amount of thermal energy required to change the phase of a substance without raising the temperature. Each working fluid has a chemically defined specific and latent heat value. Water in the liquid state has a specific heat of 4.187 kilojoules per kilogram, but its latent heat value is 2,257 kilojoules per kilogram. From this ratio, it is clear to see that by utilizing the latent heat of vaporization, we are able to expel more thermal energy than with a specific heat cooling method. Let's look at how this affects the overall system with a sample calculation. Our sample calculation today depicts the numeric benefit of pumped two-phase cooling over single phase. The example is an 80 kilowatt total power system with centrifugal pumps. If we were to use a single phase liquid loop, we would need a flow rate of 134 liters per minute, assuming a delta T of 20 degrees C. This would require a pumping power of 5.3 kilowatts under an assumed pressure drop of 830 kilopascals. The same system cooled by two-phase refrigerant loop would only call for a 25 liter per minute flow rate. That is an 80% reduction. This results in required pumping power of 250 watts and assumes a 210 kilopascal pressure drop. That's a 95% reduction in consumed power. Now let's go to Billy for our second polling question. All right, it's time for our second poll question. It will appear on your screen now. The question is, what types of thermal management techniques are you currently using? Your choices are A, air-cooled heat sinks, B, heat pipes, C, embedded heat pipe heat sinks or high-K plates, D, single-phase liquid cooling, E, phase change material heat sinks, F, pumped two phase, G, none, and H, other. So again, you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. The question is, what types of thermal management techniques are you currently using? 
So as you make your selection, I will once again hand the presentation back over to Kim. Kim? Thank you, Billy. Pump's two-phase technology has significant benefits versus single-phase cooling. From our calculation on the previous slide, we determined that Pump's two-phase offered us the ability to reduce the pumping power and flow rates of our system. We also gain the benefits of utilizing the latent heat of vaporization, which results in a higher degree of isothermality and heat flux capabilities. The technology offers the ability to break traditional thermal limitations. With transient response capabilities and the added safety of using dielectric fluids, pumped two-phase cooling has become attractive in a variety of markets. Industries and markets where weight and energy consumption are a primary concern value the lower pumping power requirements of this advanced technology. Lower pumping power means smaller pumps, which yields a smaller system overall. For aircraft, missile, and ship cooling, where size and weight add cost to the design, the technology is incredibly enticing. Smaller pumps requiring less power to operate are ideal in situations where available power is limited, such as data center cooling and power electronic boards. A reduction in parasitic power and system size has the potential to, de to decrease the parent system design and offer more space to other critical components. The lower flow rates of pumped two-phase result in significant erosion benefits. Erosion occurs from high-velocity working fluid that removes the oxide layer from the tubing. As the velocity increases, the erosion rate increases. This can be observed in our natural environment. The rate in which riverbanks wash away or erode is higher when flooding, which makes water flow at higher velocity, is present. Much like how the bank of a river or stream erodes due to the force of high-velocity flow, so does the cold plate utilized in liquid cooling. Erosion in the liquid cold plate will result in reduced heat transfer over time, which will limit the life of the thermal components and the cooling system. The lower flow rates of pumped two-phase offer reduction in erosion and save costs of replacing the parts and the cooling system. As discussed earlier in the presentation, single-phase cooling operates using sensible heat, or specific heat. This means that there will be a temperature rise of 1 degree C per unit mass in the working fluid, which results in a larger delta T across the device. However, by utilizing the latent heat of vaporization, the working fluid remains at constant temperature, similar to water in boiling in a pot, which holds to 100 degrees C. This results in a higher degree of isothermality, or temperature uniformity, across the length of the device versus single phase. Applications such as laser diode cooling or LED farms where temperature uniformity is of utmost importance find the pump two phase technology appealing. The benefits of utilizing the latent heat of vaporization go beyond temperature uniformity. For high heat flux applications, pumped two phase offers the ability to meet difficult requirements without increasing the flow rate. To support higher heat fluxes, single-phase cooling would need to increase the flow rate, which, as discussed in previous slides, has adverse effects on pumping power and erosion. Since latent heat is orders of magnitude higher than specific heat, pumped two-phase offers the ability to absorb more thermal energy than with pumped single-phase cooling. As power requirements, across industries increase, the available and available space decreases, a cooling system with high heat flux capabilities is important. The technology has already seen use in directed energy weapons and electronic cooling applications. Laser diode stacks are good examples of high heat flux applications. Since these systems have multiple high power boards, cooling requirements are tight. In some laser diode applications, the heat flux dissipation rates have averaged 100 watts per centimeter squared, while others have reached above 500 watts per centimeter squared. Single phase cooling cannot meet the strict requirements due to the high pressure drops and non-uniform temperatures. In addition to high heat flux response, 
directed energy weapons, and other pulse load technologies such as power electronics have seen an increased interest in pumped two-phase technology due to its ability to handle transient flows. The technology offers continuous flow at small system sizes that can be designed to respond to high pulses and effectively transfer the thermal energy to an external sink. Advanced coatings aid in suppressing the instabilities and increasing the heat transfer coefficient. This allows the system to increase the critical heat flux limit. The end design will reduce the total mass and size while it increases the reliability and performance. Additional capabilities of pumped two-phase include the ability to transfer heat over long distances while offering cooling over large areas. The technology has been effective at cooling multiple 1.8 foot squared cold plates. The pumped two-phase technology has also demonstrated the capability of accommodating multiple cold plates in parallel and shows levels of insensitivity to gravity. Let's take a look at how transient flows loads affect cooling on multiple parallel plates as we watch the following video. In this video, we will see four parallel evaporators, each identified with a specific color to represent variable loads. Evaporator 1 is red, 2 is yellow, 3 is orange, and 4 is blue. Under steady state conditions of applying 300 watts to each evaporator at a heat flux of 80 watts per centimeter squared, we can see the incoming liquid begin to boil as it moves across the hot evaporator. At the end of the evaporator, we see mostly vapor, removing the waste heat while the temperature on the evaporator remains constant. As the plates are cycled, we'll see the heat load on evaporator number two. The heater is then turned on for two seconds and off for five. This simulates a variable load. As the temperature drops below the boiling point of the refrigerant, the flow becomes staggered and erratic. However, the flows on evaporators one, three, and four remain constant. As this video continues, we begin to cycle evaporators two and four. During the cycling, the flow on the remaining heat sinks holds steady, while evaporators two and four vary. When cycling comes to a stop, we observe all four evaporators reach a stable point with constant heat load. The par parallel place and variable load displayed in the video is achievable with pumped two-phase cooling through proper design, which is also true in orientation independence or gravity insensitivity. Gravity insensitivity is the ability for pumped two phase to work in any orientation. The picture on slide 19 depicts two tests. Tests studied pumped two phase cold plates with inlets in different locations or operating at different orientations. One inlet was located at the bottom of plate number one, while the other was located at the top of plate number two. While running the pumped two phase system, bubbles were observed at the bottom of plate number two. This observation indicates that with proper design, the technology holds the ability to work against gravity. While pump two phase is able to meet many unique thermal challenges, there are several conditions to address while designing the system. First is the potential of flow instabilities. In a properly designed system, flow instabilities are not a concern, but need to be understood during the design process. The biggest difference between pumped single phase and two phase designs are the fluid temperatures. For two phase systems, the fluid must encounter the cold plate near saturation. Therefore, additional engineering is required during the design process to ensure the correct fluid temperature. There are also unique considerations in accounting for both liquid and vapor flows. Modeling the different fluid flows and the pressure drops in a two phase system is complex. When modeling the different fluids and accounting for both liquid and vapor flow, we look at quality. Quality is the ratio of vapor mass to total mass of the system. There is an optimum quality range or sweet spot for two-phase systems. When the system is entirely vapor, the quality equals one. When the system is entirely liquid, the quality equals zero. 
a quality that is too high will result in slow instabilities. However, a quality that is too low will sacrifice your heat transfer coefficient. The graph to the right shows the relationship between the heat transfer coefficient and heat flux. By sacrificing your heat transfer coefficient, you sacrifice your heat flux capability as well. Although all of those challenges are significant, technology has been designed to overcome each one. The following slides describe a two-phase system design and the corresponding model validation. At the onset of the design, pumped two-phase cooling was selected due to an isothermal need and a drive for the reduction of power and weight. This particular design was coupled with a heat exchanger to offer further size reduction. The design was then fabricated and tested. The graph on slide 23 shows the test results nearly matching the model results. Based on the temperature requirements, the pump two-phase system was able to meet and hold tight to an extremely strict temperature range. Displayed in some of the earlier examples, pumped two-phase can be coupled with multiple thermal management techniques. Typically, heat is rejected through an additional heat sink cooled by either air, a pumped liquid loop, or a vapor compression system. For highly transient loads, pumped two-phase systems are coupled with phase change material heat exchangers. Throughout this webinar, you have learned how pumped two-phase cooling offers greater thermal advances than single-phase cooling. As technology advances and the requirements for higher power and tighter spacing increases, utilizing the pumped two-phase technology becomes even more important. During this webinar, we have explored the ways the advanced thermal pumped two-phase technology is able to reduce the flow rates and therefore reduce the size and weight of the cooling system while also managing higher power requirements. For applications in which single-phase cooling fails to meet performance goals, pump two-phase is an attractive alternative. For additional cooling techniques, please visit our webinar page to view PLAST's presentations. And at this time, we'll begin our Q&A. Thanks, Kim. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. So at this point, I'd like to welcome Devin Pellicone, Lead Engineer, Special Products at Advanced Cooling Technologies to the line. And I'd like to remind our attendees that if you have a question, you can submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. So hello, Devin. We have some questions here already. The first one that we have, how stable is pump two phase at high flow qualities does dry out occur? That's a good question. Um, at high qualities, pump two phase actually can become quite unstable. So the goal for designing a pump two phase system properly is to keep the quality uh, somewhere in between 0.3 to 0.5. When you get to higher qualities, you generate too much vapor. The vapor can start to cause some instabilities in the system. So it's best to keep that flow quality low. Devin, here's another question from an attendee. What are the saturation temperatures of typical dielectric refrigerants, and what are the operational pressures? There are three refrigerants that you would typically use. R134A is probably the most common, R245FA, and sometimes um, R410. 134A is a relatively high pressure refrigerant. Its saturation temperature is um, about 20 degrees C, but that's somewhere around 80 PSI. 245 FA is the low pressure option. Uh, its saturation temperature, um, pressure at room temperature, is around 20 to 25 PSI. And R410 is, is the highest of the pressure refrigerants. It would be about a 200 PSI um, pressure at the uh, at ambient temperature. Devin, what kinds of fluids are typically used in pump two-phase solutions, and what criteria should someone use when making their selections? So the main fluids are typically refrigerants, and that's mostly because they're, they're dielectric and they often boil at relatively low temperatures and low pressures. The criteria is often re resolves around what pressure you want to operate the system at. Most of the refrigerants can operate anywhere in the, the realistic temperature spectrum but you want to make sure that your pressure is not so high that your tubing gets big, 
Um, you have to worry about the stresses in your system and bursting pipes. You want to take into account what kind of size and weight system you want to have as well as cost, and that helps you determine what operating pressure you want to be at. Refrigerants are also a good choice because they don't freeze at typical operating conditions or transport conditions, so they're, they're great for, for filling the system and not having to worry about it. All right, we have time for one more question. The question is, can systems be sized for maximum heat flux and ambient conditions and then float low and go single phase should conditions change? Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is yes. You can use the, the refrigerants for single phase cooling if your, your heat is not sufficient to initiate boiling. It's not ideal. Uh, refrigerants are not great single phase um, cooling media. They're better for, for two-phase situations, but if your power does dial back to where your conditions are not conducive to boiling, it'll still operate as a single-phase loop, albeit probably a poor one, but it'll still be below your, your maximum operating conditions. All right, we'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question today, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. So our thanks to Kimberly Fixie, Devin Pellicone, and everyone out there for joining us. And just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.